What's really special about this system, however, is not just that we can work through multi-step synthesis problems, but that it allows us to do some free-form exploration and inquiry-based learning by virtual experiment in a chemical sandbox. So what do I mean by that? Well, consider another simple problem from the alkenes chapter showing this product that I'm supposed to try and make. What's special is that the system does not constrain us to this purpose. We have the freedom to just browse through and experiment with the available reagents on our own. For example, I wonder what this HBr reagent does. Well, that's okay, because the reagents include links out to examples and virtual textbook pages so that we can read more about it if you find that helpful. What I think is really much more helpful than just reading about a reaction is to be able to actually just try it out for yourself. I wonder what would happen if I treated this alkene with HBr. Now that is a question that the system can answer for us by predicting the major products of the reaction. Let's try another example to reinforce our understanding. I wonder what would happen if we treated this alkene with HBr. Again, the system can predict the major products of the reaction. In this case, it's two enantiomers representing a racemic mixture. The point is, after seeing these and maybe a few more examples, we can sort of figure out a pattern. I can say, ah, I get it. Whenever you see a double bond, the HBr will add to it, and the bromine will end up on the inside end of the bond. In that case, if we want to actually make this product, all we have to do is use this starting material and treat that with HBr. Now, having learned by analogy, we know how to solve this problem, which I'll go ahead and complete. Huh. Well, that's strange. I was expecting to get this target product out of that reaction, but instead the system predicted this as the major product. Well, when strange things like this happen, the system can also provide a relevant warning or hint message, such as in this case reminding us, don't forget, carbocation intermediates may rearrange. And if those words have no meaning to you, that's okay, because for pretty much all reactions predicted by the system, we can drill down on this mechanism link. I'm going to skip to the solution part for now, and what this shows us here is not only the overall reaction predicted by the system, but also a complete curved arrow mechanism diagram to show not only what the product of the reaction was, but to also explain how the reaction proceeded, including this step here, a hydride shift, carbocation rearrangement, it's the reason we got that unexpected product. But you know what would be even better than just showing someone what the mechanism is? It's to have them interactively work through an example themselves, which we can do with this Mechanism Explorer interface. Again, here's the overall reaction predicted by the system, but this time the system wants you, as a student, to complete the mechanism diagram, which we can do with this Sketcher interface. So let's see, I think the first step of this mechanism is the electrons from this double bond getting protonated by the HBr. So I'll go ahead and submit that for analysis. Here's the drawing I just submitted, and actually it's wrong. But again, note that just like with the synthesis problems, the system did not just say wrong, start over. It gives me much more specific and useful feedback than that in the form of an actual chemical structure. It says that if I drew these arrows, and the electrons actually did follow them, that would entail an intermediate product which looks like this. And hopefully I can look at this and realize, wait a second, we've got a hydrogen with a negative charge on it, two things bonded to it. Clearly that's a mistake. But that's information we can use when we go back to the drawing board to try and figure out what I did wrong. Here's the drawing I submitted first, and now I can look at that and realize, whoops, I forgot, the electrons from this HBr bond need to go away. Resubmit that. Here's the drawing I just resubmitted, and this time it is correct, it matches what the system expected, and the predicted intermediate products look good. And you may know what I consider to be a convenient feature is that at no time do we ever have to deal with the tedious task of structure drawing. Since the system always has the next step just set up and waiting for us, we can focus strictly on the actual problem solving of the mechanism, which is all about where do we draw these arrows. Let's go through one final example to really drive home this idea of free form exploration. If we go back to the synthesis interface, not only can we select any reactant from the available list, if we click on this pencil icon, now we can even sketch in our own. I mean, look at this, I'm just making this up. Here's a molecule the system has never seen before, and yet still, we can ask the question, I wonder what would happen if we treated this molecule with HBr? And to a very large degree of generality, the system can still give us a reasonable prediction, even when something strange happens, such as in this case, hey, why did the bromine end up on the far end of the double bond? 
Well, it's giving us the explanation just below. It's because of conjugate addition by a soft nucleophile with subsequent enol tautomerization. And again, if those words have no meaning to you, that's okay because we can always drill down to the mechanism. But remember, this was a novel reactant that I just drew a second ago, and yet still, the system is able to produce a complete curved arrow mechanism diagram to explain the course of this reaction. Similar to the synthesis problems, there are also a set of non-random mechanism problems that you can work on, which can be accessed by going to the Mechanism Explorer section of the setup screen and selecting a problem from this list. These problems are again much harder than the standard reaction mechanisms you'll encounter, but this also makes them much better practice for the challenging mechanism problems that instructors like to give on exams. To be sure you're ready, let's go into a little more detail on how to draw these mechanisms, because the Sketcher applet has some quirks that take getting used to. When you open up the Sketcher window, you'll see it has a lot of commands and buttons, but for the most part, there are really only three buttons that you'll ever use. The first is the Select button. This is just to move objects around, which can be helpful to lay out the image for sketching. The button you will use most often is this curved arrow button to draw arrows representing the movement of two electrons. Occasionally, when you're working on free radical reactions, you will also use this fish hook arrow to represent the movement of single electrons. These commands are also accessible by using the Insert Electron Flow menu. Once you've selected an arrow command, first click on the source of the electron arrow. This will either be an atom or a bond, and if it is an atom, note that what this really means is that the electron source is the lone pair or free radical on the atom, not the atom itself. Once you've clicked on the source for the arrow, just click on the target, which will usually be an atom or the space between two atoms where a new bond is about to be formed. The real trick to getting all of this right is to pay attention to the blue semicircles which show what your cursor is currently pointing at. For example, when I want to select this double bond as an electron source, note how the blue semicircles flank the bond. When the electron source is a bond, we also have to be careful when selecting the target because we must indicate the bond polarity. That is, if we want the electrons to end up forming a new bond to this hydrogen, which carbon from the original double bond will remain attached to this new bond? You specify this by aiming between the target atoms, and again, the key is to look for the blue semicircles which will flank the atoms of the new bond. Once you've got that right, click to place the arrow on the target, and a dotted line will appear where a new bond is about to be formed, so you can verify you made the correct selection. If you get stuck on any of the mechanism problems, Similar to the synthesis problems, you can always just ask for a hint. This will load the next expected steps reactants into the sketcher and also show you a picture of the expected products that would result after the mechanism step. All you have to do then is draw the arrows on the reactants that will lead to the expected product shown. By now you should know the basics of how to prepare and complete both random and non-random synthesis and mechanism problems. But how do you actually get credit for your work? Well, as long as you've been putting in your student ID number whenever you set up a problem, the system records your progress while you work, and then you can go to the user records section to check your progress. The part you're going to care about is the progress checklist which summarizes your assignment requirements. On the top right is the list of specific non-random problems your instructor has assigned you, each with a respective due date. On the left are the major checkpoint deadline requirements, which counts up the total number of random non-assigned problems you've completed. Basically, any problem which is not one of the assigned problems will count towards this random problem total. A minor requirement in the bottom right are the different subject categories that you'll be covering in class. This just says that, by the end of the class, you should have tried a couple problems from every chapter. If you're working on the system normally, you should actually fulfill this requirement almost automatically without even thinking about it, since every problem you complete, random or not, counts towards these chapter totals, sometimes even counting towards multiple chapters. The point is, since you have the freedom to pick any random problem to work on, the requirement is there to encourage you to try a few problems from every chapter, as opposed to just doing 50 Yalkeen problems in a row without actually learning anything new. Over the course of this video, you should have learned the basics of all of the objectives listed on this page. If any of these items still seem unclear, it may be worthwhile for you to go back and review those sections. Otherwise, that concludes this instructional video on using the Synthesis Explorer system, and if you still have any questions or encounter any issues, feel free to send us a message.